I think we should go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is John Copans. I work at the Council on Rural Development and really appreciate everyone joining today. You know, we're, we're really gonna get right to our program here. Um, time tends to be precious for these seminars. We'll, um, so uh, I'm gonna quickly turn it over to Dr. Kate McIntosh. Uh, we really appreciate this partnership with Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield. Dr. McIntosh is the senior medical officer there. And uh, what I appreciate, have come to appreciate about Dr. McIntosh is the way uh, that she can take sort of complicated scientific and health related uh, topics. And uh, just like any good doctor, help us all understand those. You know, as we, when I think back to a year ago, right? It's amazing to think back. We are right at about a year since we really were thrown into the um, disruption of this pandemic. And I can still remember a conversation I had with my coworker, Margaret, where she explained to me that we needed to change our behavior, not just for ourselves and to protect our own health, but because we had to be aware of our hospitals and our medical system and the capacity of our hospitals to, to, to handle a massive influx of sick people. And, and when I think back to that conversation, what it, what it sort of helps me reflect on is the fact that we all have a role to play in helping each other navigate this um, challenge of COVID-19. We are all constantly sharing with each other advice and best practices. And so for VCRD, that's a reason why we host this sort of a seminar is we feel like we are uh, so fortunate to have this network of people who are leaders. You are all leaders in your community. You all step forward in so many different ways. And at a moment like this, and it's been kind of a long moment at this point, to be honest, uh, we all have such a job to do in helping to keep our community and our neighbors and our families safe. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over. So the way we will structure this conversation is that Dr. McIntosh has a presentation for us. Uh, she may pause a few times as we go through the presentation to field some questions, and then we'll probably have a little bit of time at the end uh, to field questions as well. Yeah, we'll try to manage, if you wanna ask your questions via typing them into chat, that's okay. We'll do our best to manage that. But you also can use the raise hand function if you've got a question as well, uh, once we get to time for Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McIntosh. Oh, you know what? I see, I just wanna acknowledge, I see uh, our executive director of, uh, of the Council on Rural Development uh, just joined us here. And Paul, I hope you would just, just say a quick hello to us uh, as, as we get going, going here. Well, thanks, John. I, I don't need to do that. I really appreciate being on the call with everyone else. We're all learning. And it, this is an exciting moment as we lean towards herd immunity and progress um, through this pandemic and back to better times. So. Um, it's an honor to be part of the conversation. Thank you, John, for your leadership. Great. Thanks, Paul. And with that, uh, Dr. McIntosh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, John. So this presentation, which I'm going to hopefully effectively share here, this is really for you guys. Um, I want to make sure that I answer your questions. I want to make sure that I be as clear as I possibly can. Um, it's a really exciting time with the vaccines. It's a confusing time with the variants. And I just wanted to be able to try to put this and into, into context. I also need to make very clear that I've tried to make this as up-to-date as I possibly can, but things change by the day. And so uh, there may be things on here that are out of date already, even though I revised it yesterday. Um, so things are changing so quickly. So I want to make sure that, that we, that we, uh, talk about that and acknowledge that what I say today may not be accurate a week from now. So 
this glass sculpture uh, that you see before you is actually a photograph of a glass sculpture done by a man by the name of Luke Jaram. And I felt as though I could use this picture because I actually bought this photograph from him many years ago as a Christmas present for my father. My father is a coronavirus specialist. And so I actually bought this for him long before COVID was a thing. Um, but I wanted to put it up here because I wanted to point out the parts of this virus that we're going to talk about today. So this is the virus that is causing all of the trouble. And the, the white spaghetti-like stuff that you see in the middle, that is the mRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA. That is the RNA, the mRNA of this virus. And so we're gonna talk about mRNA when we talk about vaccines, when we talk about the Moderna vaccine and we talk about the Pfizer vaccine. These things that are sticking up on the outside, these are the spike proteins, the things that look like three leaf clovers on a spike. Those are the spike proteins. And we're gonna talk about spike proteins when we talk about variants and mutations and why we worry about these variants and these mutations. So, you know, remember the picture in your mind because we're gonna talk about these pictures of this virus um, as, we go, as we go forward. And I'm gonna be referring back to the things that you saw in this picture as I, as I talk. So we're gonna talk about, um, oh, now this is interesting. I've got to figure out how to forward in, my, in this new environment. I'm in, I'm in two different desktops, which is what makes this so confusing. So I wanted to show you here with the, uh, this is from the New York Times and you can look this up. Um, this is the coronavirus tracker and we're gonna talk about the vaccines, the various vaccines that are there. But for the purposes of talking about vaccines, I wanted to remind, I wanted to review what phase one and phase two and phase three mean, because this is true for drugs and it's true for vaccines, but it's really important as we talk about vaccines. So phase one of a vaccine really means, is it safe, right? So we, we give it to 500 people and we make sure that no one has a horrible side effect or dies, right? That is, that is what a phase one trial is. It is really asking the question, is this drug safe? Not does it work, is it safe? Phase two is also asking, is it safe? We gave it to 500 people. They did okay. Nobody had horrible side effects. Nobody died. Now we're going to give it to, you know, 20,000 people and see whether anyone has horrible side effects or anyone, anyone dies, see if they have major complications. So phase one and phase two are not about does it work? They really are about is it safe? It's not until you get to phase three that you start to see the question, does it actually work? And so there are 20 drugs or 20 vaccines currently in the international pipeline in phase three. And so we're going to talk about uh, some of those, some of the more exciting ones, um, what's out there. And then there are six vaccines in the world right now authorized for earlier limited use. And I want to emphasize that those vaccines include the three vaccines that are now approved for early or limited use in the United States. The United States has not approved any vaccines yet for full use. The countries that have approved vaccines for full use are by and large China and Russia. And many of those vaccines were approved by their governments for full use while they were still in phase two safety trials. So just because we don't have vaccines that have been approved for full use does not mean that those vaccines that are approved for full use are better than ours which are approved for limited use, nor does it mean that they're better studied than the ones that we are using. It's a, it's a difference of authorization process. The United States insisted that drugs go through phase three trials, that they be shown to be effective at the same time that they were safe before they could be approved for limited use. And they're holding off on approval for full use because things are moving so quickly that usually a drug to be a drug or a vaccine to be approved for full use needs substantially additional data. It's also worth noting that there are four vaccines out there that have been abandoned um, after trials. These are all in the United States. They're drugs that were put into clinical trial or vaccines that were put into clinical trials and didn't give the results that that um, people wanted to see. And so they were they were abandoned um, as other vaccine opportunities came forward. So let's talk about the vaccines that are out there. So there are three vaccines approved for emergency use in the United States. The first two you're fairly familiar with, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the Moderna. They're both mRNA vaccines. The third one was just approved this week. Um, it is an adenovirus-based 
vaccine also called either a Trojan horse vaccine or a viral vector vaccine. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Trojan horse um, myth from Greek mythology, but essentially it, it gets into the cells by pretending to be an adenovirus. And then because it contains the genetic material of the, of the COVID vaccine, it allows the body to mount an immune response to not only the adenoviral vaccine, but, or not only the adenovirus, but also the, the, the COVID virus. Adenovirus is a common cold virus. Um, there are many adenoviruses. They affect all kinds of different animals, including humans, and there are a lot of them. Also in the pipeline in the United States is what is the Novavax uh, vaccine, which is a protein-based vaccine. So again, all three, the first three that have been approved are all based on genetic material, the white stuff that's in the center of the virus. Um, and then the, and we'll talk about a little bit more about what that looks like. And then the protein-based vaccines are the ones that use those spike proteins, the ones that were hanging off the outside of the virus. It takes those and manufactures those into, into a vaccine. So they do not contain any genetic material. Those vaccines are still in clinical trials. The Novavax is in phase three. The Sanofi GlaxoSmithKline, which is another one, is in phase two. But those are out there and they are in the US pipeline. So I wanted to give you a sense a little bit of the uh, leading international pipelines, the international COVID vaccines that are out there in addition to the Pfizer and the Moderna. There are four different adenoviral vector vaccines. So it's not the Johnson and Johnson might have made it out in the US first, but the Oxford AstraZeneca um, has been approved in, in the UK and the EU. Um, and then there is a Russian one and a one and a Chinese one, both of which are approved in the two. The Russian one and the Chinese one are two of the ones that are approved for full use. They approved those pretty early on. Um, these all contain adenovirus. Um, the uh, Russian one contains two separate adenoviruses, one in the first dose and a different one in the second dose. Uh, the canosine is a single dose. It contains an adenovirus number five. Ours contains adenovirus 26. And the Oxford one is interesting. It actually uses a chimpanzee adenovirus rather than a human one. Of the protein viruses, the Novavax is out there, but so is the Vector Institute out of Russia has a vaccine that is a protein one that is in the pipeline. And then there are five inactivated viral vaccines. Inactivated virus is a technique that's used in um, the polio vaccine and a series of other vaccines. Um, there are five of them out there, most of them from China, but the, the Bharat Biotech is, is out of India. So just to give you a sense of what's out there um, in terms of the vaccines. So let's talk about mRNA vaccines, because the, the technology that's used for both the mRNA vaccines and the adenoviral vaccines has been the subject of various you know, discussions about whether it's an okay thing or not an okay thing. So I want to talk about them, because the reality is the technology is new to the commercial market, but it has been around for a really long time. So the, the mRNA vaccines take advantage of the process that the body already uses to fight off the viruses. This technology has never been used in a vaccine, but it has been studied for more than a decade and mostly looking at, at novel cancer therapies. So this is a new, um, a new technology that may actually have more use in cancer therapy as well as in vaccines. The vaccines do not contain a live virus and you cannot catch COVID-19 from the mRNA vaccine. The mRNA from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell and it does not affect or interact with a person's DNA at all. It's not going to alter your genetic material. The adenoviral vaccine is an interesting vaccine because the adenoviral carrier is a DNA virus, not an RNA virus. So what, they, what is done is the mRNA from the COVID virus is actually translated backward into DNA. And then the DNA is incorporated into the DNA of the adenovirus, which is the carrier. And I'll show you a picture to demonstrate this. This has never been used successfully in vaccines before, but it's been studied for years. They, they wanted to make an HIV vaccine using this technology and they weren't able to, but it has more to do with the HIV than it does with the technology. The technology is sound. The problem with HIV is it mutates so quickly that it was very, very difficult to capture it in a vaccine. And that's really why it didn't work. But they've trialed 
this and they know that the technology is safe. One of the challenges though, is that your, react, your immune system is reacting to two things, the adenovirus and the COVID. And you may have to keep changing the adenovirus so that you don't get an immune reaction to the adenovirus that overwhelms your reaction to the COVID. So we aren't entirely sure. We know that this works on the first dose. We know that the Russian vaccine works when you use a different adenovirus for the first dose and the second dose. We're not sure in terms of longevity what this means if, you, if it turns out that we need doses every year. So the, one of the challenges of this, of this pandemic is that we are experiencing science at the pace at which science moves. And so we are at the cutting edge of what we know about these adenovirus vaccines, but there are still things that we don't know about. We know it works very well for the first dose. The first, the first time, we aren't sure in terms of repetitive whether it will or not. It may and it may not, and we just don't know. And this is one of those places where we have to learn as time goes on because we are experiencing life at the pace of science. So this uh, demonstrates both, the two different vaccines are both on this slide. The DNA vaccine is the adenoviral vaccine that I talked about. The RNA is the RNA vaccine. So in the case of the DNA vaccine, the coronavirus gene is incorporated into the DNA of the virus. It goes into the body. And in this case, these cells that pick it up are the immune system cells. So I want to emphasize here, it, although it is taken up by the cell and into the nucleus of the cell, this is the normal immune response that we have to all DNA viruses. This is how we fight them off. They don't alter our genetic material. We simply use the nucleus of our immune cells to process mRNA, to create the viral proteins that we see on the surface of the virus. And then those proteins are expressed on the surface of the immune cells basically with the message, this is abnormal, come take care of it, come immune system, come have lunch, come take care of this virus, this virus is bad. And that is how you activate the immune system. For the RNA, the RNA is encased in a little fatty blob that is injected into the body. Those are taken up by the cell. They stay in, in the outside of the cell, but the same thing happens. The body makes the viral proteins, puts them on the surface and says, these are foreign. We don't recognize them. These are bad. Come have lunch. Come on immune system. Activate. Fight off this virus. That is how these, that is how these vaccines work. Are there, are there questions yet? Yeah, let me give you a couple quick ones. Uh, is there a difference between emergency use and early slash limited use when it comes to the approval process? No, no, they're the same. Uh, is, uh, do we know the shown efficacy of the Chinese and Russian vaccines? You know, it's a little bit hard to tell because um, their reporting may or may not be completely accurate, but they actually don't, if, if, if the, data that we're getting out of those countries is accurate, they're not too bad. They seem to be effective. Um, the adenovirus vaccines, the data we're getting on the Johnson & Johnson is pretty good and it's not, I mean, it actually is, it's, as I'll show you later, it's 100% effective at preventing people from dying of COVID. If their adenoviral vaccines are as effective as ours, that's not, that's not too shabby. Uh, you know, that raises another question, which is, I, as we get more information on these, I think people are sort of developing maybe preferences mm -hmm. for one or another. Like, do you have advice for folks in terms of like, as they think about Pfizer versus Moderna versus uh, the uh, Johnson & Johnson? You know, at this point, the best vaccine you can get is the one you can get into your arm. Um, I, I think there's going to be time down the road if it turns out that people have to have booster shots or that we have to do this every year for people to pick and choose whichever one they want. But right now, our ability to control this pandemic is really based on how many people can we vaccinate. And there are pros and cons to both vaccines. So at this point, I think I would take what you can get. Um, they're all going to work. They're all going to be effective. They're all going to they're all going to stop the pandemic. And that's really the goal. And a, a related question, which is kind of specific, but if you're immunocompromised, there's an argument to give them the vaccine earlier because they're, uh, they, uh, they suffer harm in a greater way from, but also potentially the impact of the vaccine could be different. For example, uh, the specific question is, should, should I wait for the protein-based virus? For example, I have no spleen, I make no B or T cells, would a person like me wait? So 
so if you have no spleen, you don't, you may not make B cells, but that you, but you may still have a T cell reaction. Um, and I would say that if you have something that specific, it's better to talk to your doctor about it. But generally the recommendation is probably going to be to go ahead and get vaccinated for all of the reasons that you spoke of before. But I think when you have people with very complicating medical, complicated medical um, conditions, it's best to talk to your doctor because they can tailor the advice to your own particular medical needs. What I can tell you though, is I've been vaccinating for the state. Blue Cross has donated me as it were one day a week to be able to vaccinate for the health department. And we're vaccinating everybody who come and some people, you know, some people have immune immune conditions, some people on medications, but you know, I, it's, there are very few people who can't get the vaccine. Uh, another couple of questions and then I'll let you get back to it. Uh, if you get uh, the Johnson uh, vaccine now, could you get the mRNA vaccine later? So that's needed? being studied right now. I mean, I think the answer is going to turn out to be yes, but I, th that's actually in studies right now um, to find out whether a dose of, a, of an adenoviral vaccine plus a dose of an mRNA vaccine is more or less protective than we may find out that a dose of an adenovirus vaccine and a dose of an mRNA vaccine is better than two doses of an mRNA vaccine. We just don't know yet. So those studies are ongoing, along with the open question of how many of these do we need to get? I mean, is this going to be your annual flu shot or is it like your annual flu shot or is this, you know, a, a one and done? And we just don't know the answer yet. Should we, given sort of the pace of development and I'm reading here sort of the learn as we go with some of these vaccines, should we be concerned about the negative long-term effects? So again, these technologies have been in phase one and two trials for a really long time. So they haven't hit phase three for this particular virus, but these technologies have been uh, screened in phase one and two. So I think that the answer is, is that we don't, we don't know 100% what things are going to be, but the reality is that these technologies are not particularly different in any way that would make anybody think that they would be more problematic than the other vaccines. And in fact, what's interesting about these mRNA techniques is that, and these DNA techniques is they may actually have fewer, fewer long-term effects than some of the other vaccines that are out there because they so closely mirror what your immune system already does. So they're very clever. And, um, and in some ways they may in fact turn out to be superior to other vaccine technologies. So the honest answer is we don't know, um, but we do know that, the, that we do have experience with phase one and two trials that do show safety and don't show long-term complications. And then in addition, um, the mechanisms are such that, that the immunologists don't think that there's going to be an issue because it mirrors what your body already does. All right, one last one, and then uh, I'll let you. What about children? Uh, are they going to be vaccinated? And what does that sort of timeline look like? So you'll see this on another slide that, that is coming up. So kids, so so the Moderna has, Moderna has already started trials in children to 12 and over, 12 to 16. So the Pfizer vaccine is approved down to 16. The Moderna is approved down to 18. Um, the 12 to 18 trials have started in, the, in Moderna and um, the answer is yes. I mean, children are 25% of the U.S. population and a much larger percentage of the rest of the world population. If you want herd immunity, you have to vaccinate kids. So this is, again, this is science in real time. So normally, this is exactly what happens. You create a vaccine like the hepatitis A vaccine, you give it to adults, and then you trial it in kids down to about age 12, and then you start giving it in kids age 12 and above. And then you start trialing it in five and above, and then you give it to the kids who are five and older, and then you look at it in infants. And the, and the over a period of about 12 years, the hepatitis A vaccine went from being an adult-only vaccine to being given to one-year-olds. So that progression is simply being telescoped down into a much smaller, um, much smaller timeline, but this is the normal progression. And yes, those trials are coming. And I think the hope is to get it approved you know, younger and younger over the next, you know, over the next year. Great. All right. You go back to your presentation. Keep the questions coming though, folks. It's great. Keep them going in chat and we'll, uh, we'll sort of store them up and come back at them.
So some of these, we, there is some on here that I've already answered, but we'll we'll go over them. So I want so the the COVID nineteen um, Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna is two doses, twenty eight days apart. The Pfizer is two doses between twenty one and twenty eight days apart. And what I'm showing you here on this slide is the efficacy: ninety four point one percent for the Moderna, ninety five for the Pfizer. That's from the studies. The safety profiles for this vaccine, mild to moderate side effects are common, and I'm gonna show you those. Anaphylaxis is rare, it gets reported, but it's, it can be serious. And this is why when you go to get a shot, if you get the Moderna or the Pfizer, they're gonna make you sit there for between 15 and 30 minutes, depending on your medical history, um, before, they, before they let you leave. So from the Moderna package insert, the Moderna side effects are worse than the Pfizer, but only just. So I use the Moderna because it's kind of the worst of the lot. Side effects are common. Uh, pain at the injection site, fatigue, pain at the end. And they're worse with the second dose. And the younger you are, often the worse they are. Now, that doesn't mean that an 18-year-old is guaranteed to have a lot of issues or that a 55-year-old is guaranteed to have none. Um, you know. Different people have different reactions to the vaccine. There are 20 year olds who have no reaction and there are 90 year olds who get really tired and have some pain at the injection site. But by and large, the older you are, the, the fewer side effects you have, the younger you are. And we, we're, you, we'll see that with the adenovirus vaccine too, I'll show you, because they actually did the studies and broke it out by age. So for the mRNA vaccines, pain at the injection site is common, fatigue is common, headache is very common, uh, muscle aches, joint pains, chills, uh, vomiting, you know, muscle aches, joint pains, and chills are, you know, almost 50%. And then nausea, vomiting, some swelling, fever, and redness, you see all of those. And, and those are not at all common. What I'm finding if you have employees who are getting vaccinated is that, especially with the second dose, people will often have to miss a day of work. So it's something to just keep in mind if you run a business in terms of, if you want to encourage your folks to get vaccinated, you might want to think about can you give them, you know, a free a free CTO day after they get vaccinated so they don't have to take CTO because people can feel kind of raunchy, but it goes away. I mean, you can feel horrible. And then within 20, usually within, you know, 24, 36, 48 hours, you feel fine, completely fine. For the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's a single dose, not two doses. And let's talk about the efficacy. It appears to be, first of all, I want to say it's better than the flu shot. 66% effective at preventing COVID entirely, 85% effective at preventing moderate to severe illness. That really should say moderate illness as opposed to severe illness. And it is 100% effective at keeping you out of the hospital and, and, and preventing deaths. So when people talk about, oh, it's not as effective, well, it it, it is still pretty impressively effective if it is present, preventing hospitalization and death 100% of the time. And that is a typo. It should be 85% effective at preventing moderate illness because the severe folks end up in the hospital. So it's 100% effective at preventing severe disease. That's my typo and I apologize. From a safety profile, it is substantially less problematic than the mRNA vaccines. It has substantially fewer side effects. Anaphylaxis is very rare. Um, and let's talk about the side effects. So what's fascinating about the package insert for the Johnson & Johnson is they break it out into 18 to, six, 18 to 59 and over age 60. And what you can see is there's a substantial drop in the side effects once you get over the age of 60. So pain at the injection site goes from 58% to 33%. Fatigue goes from basically 44% down to 29.7%. You know, Headache drops as well, muscle aches, fever, um, dro fever drops from 12.8% down to 3% if you're over the age of 60. So this is a vaccine with much fewer side effects. Um, and this actually makes sense, right? Because the side effects that you get from a vaccine are your body mounting an immune response to the vaccine. The stronger the side effects, potentially the stronger the immune reaction. And so a vaccine that works better may have more side effects. A vaccine that works less well may have fewer side effects. And we actually have seen this with the, to take a slight detour, we've seen this in children with the pertussis vaccine. The original pertussis vaccine caused a lot of fever. 70% of kids who got the pertussis vaccine that was used when I was a kid got fevers and they could get quite high fevers with it but it worked extremely well to prevent pertussis. We now have a new pertussis vaccine called the acellular pertussis vaccine. The risk of fever dropped from 70% to 7%, but the vaccine simply doesn't work as well. Fewer side effects, 
but it doesn't work as well. So there's a bit of a mixed bag with those side effects. I mean, this is a, there's some give in this equation about which is better and which is worse. So I wanna talk really quickly before I break for more questions about efficacy, because I think this is really important. We hear about efficacy. What does efficacy mean? Pfizer has 95% efficacy. Moderna has 94.5% efficacy, 94.1% efficacy. What does that mean? I wanna talk about the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, because they're different. And, 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 there, and this is important. Efficacy is how the vaccine works during clinical trials. When you've selected your population, and, and this is true for drugs as well, which is part of why I, wanna, I want to talk about this because this is important to know for medicine as well and for other things, um, things like CPAP machines, other stuff. Um, efficacy is how well it works during the trial. So for example, in a drug trial, you know people are taking the drug. <laughs> you, you, know, you know that, and in this case, you know that the vaccine was stored in exactly the right place, drawn up exactly the right way, given exactly the right way, that is the efficacy. Effectiveness is how does it work in the real world? How does it work when you know it's being given at your local health department? How does a drug work when people may or may not actually take it all the time? You know, how does a CPAP machine work for sleep apnea in the real world when you know you don't have an expert at your house setting it up for you every single night? That's the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. They are related, but they're not the same. Now, with vaccines, they should be pretty close because we know the needle went into your arm, right? So we know you got it. It's not really up to you. Um, but so the efficacy is the number of people in the trial. It's also calculated a little bit differently. So the efficacy is the number of people in the trial who got the vaccine, who got sick, compared to the number of people in the trial who got the placebo and got sick. And the relative difference between these two is the efficacy. The effectiveness is really your experience. Like what is your chance of getting COVID once you've had the vaccine? And that can vary by age, by medical condition, especially if those weren't studied, it can change over time. So those are the, those are the things that, um, and you know, and then there's storage issues and all of that. So the actual effectiveness, you're gonna start to see reports coming out about effectiveness. And the effectiveness is now that we've released it into the, into the wild, as it were, how well is it working? compared to the efficacy. So if you see those two and it's confusing, that's why. So talking about the vaccine administration rollout, if you guys don't know about the uh, Vermont Department of Health vaccine dashboard, this is a great one. Um, it's, it, they update it every day. Um, Rutland is beating the rest of the state and deserve a prize for their, their um, efficiency in vaccinating people. They've vaccinated almost 23% of their population as of yesterday. Very impressive. They deserve kudos. Whatever you're doing down in Rutland, I'm impressed. Um, but so this shows you where your state, where your county is at, who's getting vaccinated. It's, it's dynamic, so you can click through it. I, I highly recommend this if you're curious about who's getting vaccinated and what's going on. It tells you how many doses we have in the state, how many we've administered, who's gotten one dose, who's gotten two. Um, it's a, this is a great, this is a great tool. So I did answer this a little bit, the question of who can get the vaccine. Almost everyone can get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, again, if you if you have a very complex medical history, do check with your doctor. Um, what you will hear is, oh, I have a history of an, of an anaphylactic reaction to shellfish. Is that a problem? And the answer is probably not. Um, but individuals who have a history of an anaphylactic reaction, I'm gonna talk about what an anaphylactic reaction is, to either shellfish or to an injected medicine have to be monitored for 30 minutes rather than for 15. So an anaphylactic reaction is a reaction that requires the administration of an EpiPen or a shot of epinephrine after you got an allergic reaction to a medicine or some other substance that was given either intravenously or injected into your body. So if you got penicillin and got a rash, that doesn't count. If you eat shellfish and it makes you nauseous, it might if you need an EpiPen. If you don't, if, it, if, if it's something else, then you don't. If, if you have a bee sting allergy, we don't have to worry about that. That's not an injected medication. So it's a very limited criteria. Um, but for example, if you got iodine and if you got iodine as part of a medical procedure and you broke out in a rash, that's okay. But if you got iodine and you had trouble breathing and they had to give you a medicine, that counts and you're wait for 30 minutes. 
Shellfish, if you carry an EpiPen for shellfish, that counts, you're gonna wait for 30 minutes. If you're pregnant, I'll be honest, every time I turn around, the guidance changes, you gotta to talk to your doctor. I think that's, that's still something that's evolving on a regular basis. So if you're pregnant and you wanna know if you should get the COVID vaccine, talk to your, talk to your OB. And we talked about children um, and what's coming. We will get there. We will get there for kids. So I wanna talk next about variants, but let's, I can take questions before we get on to variants. Uh, one question, why is the dose constant uh, for, for the masses, I guess? In other words, so if you're a little tiny kid or a big adult, why is the, why is the dose the same? Um, generally with adults, so, so it may not be the same for kids. Um, children, children are, I'm a pediatrician by training and children are not little adults. So sometimes children need a smaller dose and sometimes, interestingly enough, children need a larger dose. <laughs> so kids' immune systems are not adult immune systems. So th those studies are going to get done and they're going to figure out what dosing is appropriate for kids. But by and large, when you're talking about the immune system, the immune system is relatively constant, at least between 18 and about 60 to 65. And so the use of a, of a regular dose is, the, is going to be the same here. In the elderly population, sometimes you do find that you have to change the dosing. And we may see dosing changes come depending on what we find in terms of, long, of longevity of the, of the vaccine. So for example, um, the shingles vaccine that is out there is a bit now is a very high dose vaccine compared to the chickenpox vaccine that we give to kids because the, the elderly immune system is, is a little bit less flexible and need, need for sh at least for chicken pox needs a little bit of an extra goose because shingles is chicken pox. So um, I, I think that it's a good question and it's one that we may find that we have to make adjustments to as we look at that real world, um, that, that real world effectiveness. Once we roll out into the, into the real world starting to look and start to look at effectiveness, it, we may find we have to change the dosing. So we'll see. It's a very good question. All right, one other question for you. I think you've got our competitive juices flowing with that county to county comparison. How do you, like, how do we understand the differences there? Is that about like facilities or availability? Like what, what how do we think it is that Rutland's doing better than other places? You know, I'm, I'm sure that if you, if you talk to people, everybody would have a theory. I don't know that I have an answer for it. I'm just impressed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one factor is whether people choose, right? There's a group of people who are eligible and that's gonna vary by county. And then there's uh, those who, who choose, who are eligible, who choose to get the best. Yeah. There's so there's many a, variables, right? There are a lot of variables that, you know, there's, there's who's vaccinating, how many, you know, how many people do they have vaccinating? How fast are they pushing people through? How many people are signing up? Yeah, I think there's a lot of variation in any given setting. But great. I, do, I do think Rutland is doing great. <laughs> All right, back to you. So I wanted to talk about variants um, because the coronavirus variants have been in the news a lot and we're, they're gonna be in the news more. So let's talk about what a variant is. So a variant is a mutation in the genetic material of the virus. So that's that white part that I showed you, the spaghetti, the white spaghetti in the middle of the virus. That's in that mRNA, that's where the mutation happens. And mutations are common in coronaviruses. Um, they're not as common as they are in viruses like HIV. Uh, there are other viruses that mutate much more quickly, but these, these coronaviruses are mutating. Most mutations do not affect the virus in any meaningful way. So there are, there are, well, the data keeps changing on how many, but there are thousands of known mutations for coronavirus. There were 4,000 known mutations in the coronavirus. And then, um, and there's a thousand, over a thousand known mutations in the US alone. So most mutations don't affect the virus. And, but the, the key here to the variants is this, the more people who have COVID, the more people who are, who are susceptible, the more likely we are to see mutations. And this comes down to the math. So we, so we have to understand math on this. And I hope this doesn't freak everybody out, but I think it's important. Remember, viruses are really, 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 really tiny. You can't see them under a microscope. You need an electron microscope. One person with COVID can have as many as 
here's the scientific notation, 7.11 times 10 to the eighth RNA, what does that mean? That is 711 million viruses just on a throat swab. So you open your mouth, I swab the back of your throat and I count the copies of the RNA that are on there. There, are, there could be 700 million copies of that RNA just on that throat swab. That is a lot of virus. At peak infection, without the vaccine, the total number of viruses in our bodies is often in the billions or higher. And this is not just true of coronavirus. This is true of all viruses, measles, chicken pox, the common cold, whatever virus it is, the number of actual copies of the virus in our body is incredibly high. And every time that virus replicates, it can mutate. So that's why it's important to understand that in the normal process of replication, you get mutation. So that tells us why vaccinating is so important to reduce variants. Because if you have vaccinated people, you have fewer people who get COVID at all. The people who do get COVID often have fewer viruses in their body. So instead of having a billion, they might only have 500,000 or 200,000 copies of the virus. Fewer mutations, fewer, fewer individual viruses equals fewer mutations equals fewer emerging variants. So vaccination is important partially because it helps keep us safe, but it's also critical because the more people who are vaccinated, we're gonna get fewer variants. And that's gonna make coronavirus easier to fight. So this is the role of vaccination in reducing variants. It's a critical, critical point. So let's talk about variants a little bit because I think it's important. Um, I don't expect you to memorize this slide and there will be no test. However, you've probably heard of these. The Spanish one you may not have heard of, but then there's, there's one out of the UK these are just the ones that's, that we are more nervous about. The South African, I listed one of the Brazilian, there's a couple, but that's one of them. The California virus, this is a new mutation that's just been identified. We're gonna talk about it because it's been in the news. And what I wanted to point out here is that what's fascinating about these viruses is that they seem to mutate in the same places. So the spike mutation in the UK, the South African and the Brazilian variant is this number E484K. And we're gonna talk about why we care about that. Interestingly enough, I just saw a variant yesterday after I had done this slide deck, or maybe it was this morning, talking about a variant in New York City that also has this, E48, this E484K um, mutation. And we're gonna talk about why that's important and why we care about E484K particularly. And then the spike mutation in California has a whole series of new ones that I hadn't seen before, but we'll talk about why the Californian one might be, you know, why, since it's in the news, we'll talk about what makes that important. So the first question about a mutation in, a, in the coronavirus is do we care? right? We might not care. It might not change how the virus affects us. And so the Spanish one is a beautiful example of this. It's dominant in Europe. It's not the virus that's spreading through, that was spreading through Europe was not the same. It was a mutated version of what was spreading through China, but it doesn't appear to have changed much about it. It had the same transmission from person to person as the original, and it seems to have caused the same amount of illness and death as the original. So that's an, an example of a virus variant where it didn't really change how it behaved in us. And what we care about is how does it affect us, right? If it, if it wants to change its stripes, that's okay. But if it starts to change how we get sick, that's when we start to care. The UK virus by comparison has changed how it interacts with us it is 50% more likely to transmit. So that means, for example, if the first original virus, if I have the original virus and I am not vaccinated and there's no social distancing and no masks and I'm gonna pass it on average to three and a half people or three people, if something's 50% more transmissible, that means now instead of passing it to three people, I'm gonna pass it to on average four and a half people. If you do the math over several generations of that, that's a lot more people who are gonna get sick. Interestingly, in children, it doesn't seem to be passing any more, any more in kids than the original. Um, however, the, it may be linking to more deaths, but it's not entirely clear yet. It's clearly not horribly more dangerous than the original, but it does appear to be maybe 10 or 20% more dangerous as far as cause, it, cause of death. What's interesting about it, and this is also why vaccines are, more impor are really important, is it has many mutations. 
And this goes to that question about being immunocompromised. One of the challenges of being immunocompromised is if you do catch it, you have a hard time fighting it off. And they think that the UK virus came from a single immunocompromised person who was infected for a really long time. And there were a lot of mutations that happened because that person could not fight off the illness. So that's just a sort of interesting science fact that I think is fascinating. The South African is where we start to get concerned about this E484K variant. And the reason is that the South African, what's interesting is the South African one and the other ones that have this, the Brazilian one and the um, this New York one, they all seem to have come from separate sources. But for whatever reason, this E484K mutation seems to happen a lot spontaneously. And the reason we care about it is that for antibody cocktails that we're using to help fight it off, they can't bind to that mutation. The, the genetic chain, the change in the genetic material changes the spike protein on the surface, those things that stick up. And if that spike protein alters its, its, its shape, then our antibody cocktails can't bind. And this E484 variant appears to make it 10 times harder for that antibody cocktail to bind to. So it's going to make it harder to treat. The other concern is that it may make it harder for our vaccinated selves to fight it off. Because again, we make in our own bodies those antibodies when we get vaccinated to the spike proteins. So we get the vaccine, our body says, this is abnormal, I wanna make those antibodies and we make them to the original version of that protein. Now along comes E484K and that protein looks different our antibodies may not be able to bind to it because it's a different shape. And so that's the other concern is that not only is it going to be harder to treat people who have it, but it may be more vaccine resistant and we may have trouble fighting it off. And that's why Moderna just submitted to the FDA a new booster shot of their vaccine, which accommodates that e, E484K variant. So there's gonna be a race for a while in here between what coronavirus can mutate into and what we can create a vaccine against. And we may find ourselves doing this for a while to try to, um, to, try to get ahead of these vaccine variants. Now, the natural, life, the natural history of these vaccine variants is eventually they slow down because eventually the vaccine, eventually the, the virus finds its like best spot for itself and so at some point we're going to get fewer variants just because it's going to have mutated into its best possible form. But in that meantime, we may be chasing our tails a little bit with these variations. And we may continue to have to chase our tails, but hopefully it'll be, you know, once a year and not every six weeks. So the Brazilian also contains that same, that same uh, E484K. And again, there's a concern about the effectiveness of the antibody cocktails and people appear to be able to be getting reinfected, perhaps because their antibodies and their immune response is not fighting off this variant. The data on Brazil is still, is still developing. But if you've got, if you like biology, there's a lot of really interesting stuff on the internet. So let's talk about the California variant. The California variant is interesting. It is clearly more contagious. How more contagious, we aren't sure, but it has, it has become the dominant strain in Southern California. 44% of all viral strains in Southern California and 30 some cases in all of California are now the, the viral strain. So it is rapidly becoming the dominant strain in California and it will probably become one of our dominant strains. So that's part of why we're watching it so carefully and we care about it so much. It does appear to be more contagious. They haven't actually defined how, what more means yet. Um, but it has been described in multiple other states and even several other countries around the world. The other thing about it is this vaccine appears to reproduce like nobody's business. People who are tested have twice the viral loads of these other variants. Um, the good news is that it doesn't seem to cause quite the same issue with antibody cocktails and, and the vaccines that, um, that the South African variant does. In other words, there appears to be a better chance that the vaccine is going to prevent this variant. 
um, and a better chance that the antibody cocktails are going to work on this variant compared to the South African variant. But these increased viral loads and this contagiousness make it something that we're definitely keeping an eye on. Um, it is unclear whether it is more dangerous in terms of once you catch it, are you more likely to end up in the hospital or the intensive care unit? That data is still coming. I mean, this, this stuff is developing you know, by the week right now. This is very, very clear, very, very fast. So that's what I have. And I am happy uh, to take questions. Uh, wonderful. I'm uh, looking around the group. Uh, are there other questions? I'm gonna throw one at you that's totally unfair. <laughs> but I think a lot of us lo are looking ahead uh, to the summer, to the fall, and starting to think about sort of what things will be okay to start to do. And obviously uh, I think we're all uh, doing our best to follow the guidance, but like, as we think about the summer and the fall, like at what point, like do we need to hit a vaccination threshold here in Vermont nationally to uh, enable us to get back to some of the things, whether that's multifamily gatherings or those types of things that uh, many of us are yearning for? So I would defer to Fauci on this one, honestly, um, because they have the better sense. But the numbers that I've heard from him are that what you really do want to see is a threshold of well over 80 percent of people have been vaccinated in order to feel like you're getting toward that between 80 and 90 percent. And this is true for other vaccines. I mean, herd immunity for things like the measles vaccine is considered to be 90, somewhere between 95 and 92 and 95 is like the cutoff for herd immunity. And if you go below that, then you run the risk of having a measles outbreak in your community. So it's not unreasonable to ask that you see that those levels of immunity somewhere between like 85 and 90%. Um, I think Fauci might've said 80, but I, I can't remember, but it's I know it's in that range. Um, and the hope is that we're gonna get enough people, you know, being willing to be vaccinated to get to that point. Now, the caveat are these variants, right? So that so that if if you suddenly have a variant emerge that says vaccine, what vaccine, then you're in a completely different situation because now you are now you're in a situation where where you might have 90% vaccination to the original version, but now you've got this crazy new one on the scene that is causing problems. So the other piece of getting everybody vaccinated is to try to knock down the number of variants. I'm going to read a question from Eric here. Uh, is there any evidence to show how blood type or RH factor versus COVID play together? Yes, there's some really interesting stuff on that. I would say that the jury is still out, but there are very interest, there's very interesting data and you cannot assume that if you have one blood type, you have a death sentence. And if you have the other blood type, you're scot-free and don't have to do anything, right? So I wanna be really clear. This is relative risk, not one year, one year you're in trouble and the other year scot-free. That is not the way this works. But there is some very interesting data um, on that O blood type tends to get less, may be less likely to get disease, have disease they may also have a harder time having a positive test, even if they have symptoms of COVID, which is sort of interesting too. But they may have a slightly lower risk of hospitalization, slightly lower risk of, of severe disease compared to an A blood type. But you cannot take that to the bank because the numbers, it's, it's all about population level data with relative risk. And I wouldn't want to bank on it as a single individual with an O blood type that you're actually going to be okay. And I wouldn't want to fret if you have an A blood type. All right, here's a good one. You know, if let's say you're vaccinated, you're two weeks after your second dose uh, and you have COVID symptoms. Yeah, then you should get tested and you should quarantine. I mean, I think no vaccine is perfect. Even a vaccine with an efficacy of 95% means that out of 100% of people, out of 100 people, five of them are not immune. Right. And then there are other factors that and that's in these tests where they're selecting their populations. So in the real world, it could be higher than that. We don't know yet. And so you don't know if you're in the 95 percent who has some protection or the 5 percent who has none. So you cannot assume that just because you 
have been vaccinated that you aren't still going to get the, the disease. And so if you have symptoms, you have to treat yourself as though you do for your own sake and for the sake of the people around you. Now, I do wanna say, if you catch COVID with the vaccine, you are less likely to be very, very ill. So that's the good news is you might, you might still be susceptible to COVID, but it might not be as bad. And we have seen that in people who have been vaccinated, who've gotten COVID, they still have a positive test they still can spread it to other people, but they are not as ill as if they had not been vaccinated. So, um, but you still owe it to the people around you to try not to spread it. So that's where the quarantine and the testing comes in. And you just touched on something and I see a question from Kim, which is what is the latest thinking on someone's ability to transmit to others after they've been vaccinated? So the honest answer is we don't know entirely because we're still collecting that data, but we suspect that people who are vaccinated will have a lower viral load and probably be and probably will be less contagious. But the but that's hypothetical and the actual numbers on that are not we don't have those yet. But that's and what we we'll, see with other vaccines like uh, whooping cough or uh, chicken pox or, you know, some of these other some of these other illnesses. And how will we learn that just sort of through analyzing the population as more people get vaccinated, we will sort of learn from that and, and that's how we're gathering that data. Yeah, that's population level data that's being gathered by health departments. So this is, this becomes reportable, right? So every case of COVID is reportable right now to the health department. And if somebody is vaccinated and they get COVID, that is reportable as well. So all this data is being gathered by the departments of health around the country, and they are and they are running those numbers to see what's going on. And it's all going up to the Centers for Disease Control. And so they're getting statewide population or you know national population data on this. Great. You know, I'm not seeing other questions. Oh, Lydia, let's do one last one here. I think as I look at the clock. Uh, all right, being. Being vaccinated doesn't solve all. It just means that if and when you do contract the virus, virus you're less likely to have many uh, of the version, less versions of the virus in you, which means you should be less sick and the virus will take less hold in, herd, in the herd ultimately. Correct. So, so the first piece is that the vi being vaccinated solves a lot in that you are much, much, much less likely to get sick at all. So you might not get it at all, but then for that proportion where you might get sick, everything she just said is true. If you do catch it, you're gonna have less versions of the virus. You're likely to be less sick. You're likely to be less contagious and therefore it's less likely to spread more widely. So, and if the person that you are, the people you're living with are also vaccinated, then you might be spreading virus, but instead of them, instead of your, ability to infect them, your ability to infect them might have gone from, you know, you're going to infect three people on average down to I'm only going to infect one other person on average. But that's assuming that that one person is unvaccinated. Now my virus is hitting up against their vaccine. So they only have a 10% chance of actually catching the COVID from me or, you know, a 20, per, you know, or 5% chance of catching COVID from me. So it, it, Every, every individual around you that is vaccinated knocks it down yet one more piece. So, and, and we see this even on vaccines that are not great, like the flu shot. The flu shot's only effective about 40 to 60% of the time. But we know that if I have a grandma or a grandma and grandpa, they get vaccinated and then I vaccinate all the little kids in the family and all the other people in the family. Yes, maybe the four-year-old is gonna get the flu, but they're not gonna be as contagious they're less likely to spread it than to grandma because grandma's already got the vaccine. So now their less contagiousness is hitting up against grandma's vaccination. And this is why vaccinating the people around the elderly with the flu shot lowers deaths in the elderly. We know that when you vaccinate five-year-olds for the flu or kids under five for the flu, deaths in people over 65 drop precipitously. And that's why we vaccinate children because they're less contagious, they're less likely to get it, and then they're gonna knock up against that grandparent's immunity. And so everybody's risk of infection goes down proportionally. You know, sense. that's really helpful. I want, uh, we, sh we should bring things to a close. We're at five o'clock and here's how I'm hoping you can bring it to a close for us, Dr. McIntosh, which is you just highlighted why it's, we have a collective interest in as many people as possible being vaccinated. 
We know that there's people in our community who are hesitant about getting the vaccine. Do you have any advice for us as we talk to our family members and neighbors who are hesitant about what's the best approach for um, helping persuade them, if there is an approach uh, mm -hmm. to doing that, I guess? I think it depends on why, on, you know, so, so I'm a pediatrician by training. So I spend a lot of time talking to people about vaccinations. And I think the biggest thing to do is to, is to listen and find out why it is that they don't want to get the vaccine and then try to figure out if you can give them information for that particular reason, right? Because the reasons that people are vaccine hesitant are, there are many, many, many. And there are some people that you are never going to convince, but then there are other people who are nervous. And if they see if and if they see everybody else getting it and they're all doing fine, they're going to start to say, well, no, maybe I should get it anyway. So I think it really depends on why people don't want it. We've seen vaccine hesitancy in this country drop as more and more people have have started to get the vaccine and it's safe and you know, the, there aren't a lot of side effects and people seem to be doing well with it. And the relief of getting vaccinated is so great that I think that will break down a lot of those barriers that are, that are, you know, that are more to do with anxiety and it's not tested and it just seems strange and new and different. Um, it's a lot harder when you have someone who really has objections that are sort of much sort of tighter held and have less to do with anxiety and more to do with philosophy. That's a really difficult place. And, and there, you know, it's going to be harder to shake it loose. Uh, I really want to thank you, Dr. McIntosh, for the presentation, for fielding uh, some really excellent questions. I have to say to all of you all who have participated, this was, um, it's, it's, the level of questions uh, was impressive. And we really appreciate this uh, partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, with you and really uh, appreciate the work that everyone is doing uh, in their families and in their communities to fight this together. It really, um, it gives me a sense of hope, honestly, just to see us all here learning and, and, and trying to do better. So thank you all, really. Well, thank you guys it. for having me. All right, great. Take care, everyone.